learn tonight. I'm excited about the lesson. Amen. Last week we learned about stewardship. We learned uh, about stewardship. We've been studying on Wednesday nights back to the basics. Back to the basics. Amen. As a Christian, we ha- we need to have time where we go back and study the basic things of the Bible. Amen. We need to be reminded. It's kind of like when I used to work at, uh, you know what? I'm going to travel a little bit. I decided to try to use this thing. I just want to see how this works, Brother West. Check. Here we go. I got to stay right, right, right there. I got to remember that. But it reminded me when I worked at UPS, when I got hired on, they uh, they taught me basics. They said of how, and you never think they would have. You'd have to be taught how to unload boxes. You know, all, I got the grunt job, amen. When I went to work there, I didn't get the fancy job of driving the ve- driving the vehicles. They gave that to all the people that have been there for years. I was the newbie. So they stuck me in a trailer, and they said, here, unload these boxes. So I thought, how hard could that be? And uh, you unload one trailer full about th- full of 3,000 packages. You find out real quick how hard <laughs> that could be, let me tell you. But so that when I got there, the guy said, all right, I'm going to teach you how to load and unload boxes. I looked at him like, what? Say, all you do is pick them up, put them down. He goes, no, 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 no. He says, you get a hernia that way. <laughs> it's like, well, what do I do? So he taught me, you know, you basics. So for you that don't know how to lo- unload boxes, I'm going to teach you right here, okay? You have to keep your feet shoulder width apart, okay? You never reach out and pull to you, okay? It's called center body mass. You always go to the object, pull it to your chest, and then with your legs lift up, pull it around, set it down squat just like that so I had to learn that and so and I had a guy watch me (laughs) you know how awkward that is (laughs) and then if I didn't do it right uh, sorry I forgot and they went there was like eight steps to doing it the right way you had to do it just right if you didn't do it just right UPS let me tell you one thing I can give to them is they are about perfection. I mean, if it is not done right, they will get on to you. And so I was unloaded boxes, and they top. And so I would keep doing it, and after a while, I could unload. Now, the goal is to unload 1,100 packages an hour was their goal that I had to meet. When I first started, I could do about 1,000, which wasn't bad. It was about a little above normal. Uh, but not quite where they wanted it. So I, I had a guy stand in the trailer with me and watch me for like the first five days until I could, if I did not reach 1,100 packages an hour, then they fired you by a certain amount of time. So I was like, so I was pushing it, brother, to move. I was like, what? But as I was doing it, he reminded me, no, 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 And they would check me off, do this, do this. So eventually I got up to where I could unload like 1,500 packages an hour. I was flying. Those guys hated me it, because this is why. I was short, but I'm stocky, you know, I got, you know, you know, so I had power. And so, you know, the tall guys, there's a benefit to being short for all the tall people in here. And uh, I had part of the benefit. The only bad thing about being short was I had to have like this stand because they would pack it all the way to the roof and I couldn't reach the top. So then they, and they wouldn't let you just bring the boxes and fall them down. You know, you had to get on a stand and get up there and then pull them down. So there was a bad side to not being tall. I had to <laughs> carry the stand through the whole trailer with me. But as I would do it and I would get more comfortable, I still would have to, even after for doing it for a couple months, I still had to have somebody come back in there and they said, we're going to go back over the basics with you. Even though I was good at it, even though I met my quota, even though I was... I mean, when, when I left because I felt like the Lord was leading me somewhere else, and I told them that, and they were fine, but when I left, they hated to see me go. They were like, you do a great job. But even though I did a great job, they still said, we need to go back to the basics. They said, we need to go back and just cover the simple things. They said, because if you mess up here, it'll mess up down the line. Because what you did was you unload the box, you put it on a belt, it slides down the belt. It's the, it's the conveyor, and it slides through a conveyor belt right down the middle of the building, and then on either side are these guys pulling them off and putting them into trucks. On either side, they just pull them off the conveyor belt. And they said, if you're not doing your job right down here, they said, down the rest of the line, it's going to mess it up. And so we had to go to the basics. One of the basic things of a Christian, I believe, is this area of soul winning. We've talked a lot about some of the different basics that we went over. 
and it's good uh, stewardship and all of those things. But one of the basic things, but probably one of the most important basic things, I believe, in a Christian's life is this area of soul winning. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. And you're familiar with this, but again, we're just going to start right back from the beginning. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Man, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. So we start right at the very beginning. God gives us a command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, the word soul winning is not found in the Bible. If you look up soul winning in your uh, concordance or things like that, you're not going to find the word soul winning in the Bible. But the reason we call it soul winning is because when we go out or when you're uh, uh, maybe at work or, or, or something and you're, or you're getting groceries and the Lord leads you to talk to somebody and, and, and witness, maybe on a break or different things like that, and the Lord leads you to witness to somebody, the idea is everybody has a soul. Every one of us in the room have a soul. Every person that's ever born Every child, every human being, every man, lady, teenager, everybody has a soul. And so when you give the gospel, when you preach the gospel to somebody, you're trying, the Bible says, to win their soul. Because your flesh is going to die. Your flesh will stay here, amen, it'll die. You'll, but what will live for eternity is the soul. The soul of a man, the Bible says, is what will spend eternity in heaven. Or spend eternity in hell. And so we call it soul winning because we're after the soul. We know that the souls of men are going to spend eternity somewhere. And we want to win people to Jesus. Because, see, people are trusting something. Everybody trusts something about heaven. Whether they think it's through baptism, whether they think it's through church, whether they think it's through their dad as a pastor, whatever it is, they trust something. And so as a Christian, we call it soul winning because we know the truth from God's word. We know that Jesus is the way to heaven, that he died, he gave his life, salvation's a free gift. And we try, when we go and we witness, we're trying to win them to trust in Jesus and not anything else. So that's why we call it soul winning. We want to win them to Jesus, not to ourselves, not to the church. We're not trying to get them to come and tithe and do all these things so we can have a bigger church. We're trying to win souls to Jesus. Amen. So that's where we get the idea of soul winning. So when you hear the term soul winning, that's what we're talking about. It's reaching the lost. The Bible talks about two people in the world that are either saved or lost. You're either saved this, more, or this evening because you've trusted Jesus as your Savior or you're lost because you've never come to a point where you've accepted Jesus as, the, as your Savior from sin. And so two, two types of people. As a saved person, we're no longer lost, but our job is to go and win the lost so they can be saved as well. Once a, once a person becomes a Christian, he should strive to do as Christ did. There are only, like I said, two types of people. You can look that up in John 3.18 or John 3.36. talks about those who believe in Jesus and those who believe not. That's the saved and the lost. Now, it's a Christian's responsibility to tell every creature the good news of Jesus Christ. And when that word, when you see the word creature, amen, that doesn't mean that we go witness to the bears at the zoo. You know, we don't go to the zoo and witness to all the salabanders crawling around in the fish and show the gospel. Here, buddy, you, you know you're a sinner? No. That word creature is talking about people. Amen. Anything that has that breath of life that God gave to Adam and Eve. An individual, a person, amen, a living human being that has a soul that will live for eternity. A lot of times, uh, and, and, and I go out and I'll tell people, and they'll say, well, uh, you know, the animals will live forever and all of these things. And, you know, the Bible, talk, we talked about that. And I, t and I tell them, say, no, we're out trying to win people. People live forever. Amen. And so anyway, but so so winning. Now, I brought with me tonight an illustration. I figured all the men would like this. I love this kind of stuff. This is my sawzall. This is my impact drill. This is my regular drill, and that's it. I lost my flashlight, Brother Wes. It was like a combo, and it was one of those flashlights you play. I lost it. I couldn't believe it. I was so bad. And a battery. Batteries are expensive. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. I have drills here, 
These are tools. I love tools. I don't know if, uh, you know, ladies probably won't find this appealing. You like tools? Well, praise the Lord. Ladies, most ladies don't usually find it appealing. But men, oh, man, you give a man a good tool, we can get a lot done. Amen. I love that sound. That's the sound of happiness right there. And I, I wanted to use this as an illustration. You know, these tools, I use these, and I've had to use these these past week. And when I work with my dad, we use these tools. We, do, we use these tools to get a job done. Amen. We use tools because we want to accomplish a task. And so we have to have the right tool to do it. The Bible talks about you have to imagine yourself, your, you as an individual, you are a tool that God wants to use. God has a task that he wants to get done. Now, there are different kinds of tools, just like there are different kinds of people. Every one of us have a different job that God wants to get done. Every one of us have different people that God knows you can reach. I cannot maybe talk to your family and give them the gospel like you could. You may never see my family and be able to give them the gospel. But every one of us, the Bible says when we, we want to win souls, every one of us have souls that we come in contact with that only you come in contact with, that none of us will ever see. You are that tool that God wants to use. Now, the ultimate purpose, and this is what I wanted to illustrate. The reason I said this is probably the most important basic thing is because everything that you do, every purpose that we have for the tool, at the tr for a, that God wants to use us as a tool, anything that you do, every purpose you're ever put to for the Lord should be for the purpose of winning souls. Everything. That is why, as we see, Jesus came. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The main object that Jesus came was to be a soul winner. He wanted to win people, amen, to Jesus. He wanted people to spend eternity in heaven. That was his main goal. Now, everything he did, now he did miracles. Jesus healed the blind. Jesus healed the lame. Jesus made the lame to walk. Jesus did many things. But everything that Jesus did, his entire life encompassed one goal and that was to win souls. So our lives, Jesus is our example. As a Christian, everything you do, everywhere that God puts you to use, should end, be the end result to win souls. Our church, everything that we do, every function, every ministry, every time we have a service, everything we do is around the one object of the end result, and that is to win souls to Jesus. Now, in the process, we grow as Christians. We have to grow. We're saved, amen? You don't have to get saved over and over. You get saved and you grow. But the more that get saved, the more that there are to tell others about Jesus. But that's our goal. So when you go to work, you have people at work. You may be able to win to Jesus. When you come to church and maybe you bring a visitor, you might be able to win them to Jesus. When you go to the grocery store and somebody helps you out with your groceries, you may be able, that God may want to use you to win them to Jesus. When you go uh, to, to, out and uh, maybe you go through the drive-thru, amen, and you hand that person a track, you're allowing yourself to be a tool to win souls. Now, we get other things done in the process, just like Jesus did. Jesus got a lot of things done, amen, while he was on this earth. He did a lot of miracles. He, did a lot, he, he went a lot of places. He helped a lot of people. But everything he did ended up with winning souls. And so the heartbeat of a church, the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of a Christian should be to win souls. Matthew 28, 19, you know it, talks about going, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. And talks about uh, giving the gospel. That's the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15. Luke 14, 23. And John 15, 16. All of these are to go and preach the gospel. Now, number one. Soul winners are commanded. Soul winners are commanded. In Matthew 28, 19. Mark 16, 15. Luke 14, 23. And John 15, 16. Every one of those verses have the same word. And that's go. God said, go. Amen. We're commanded. God doesn't give us an option. As a Christian, he says, you've got to go. 
God commands you to go, amen? God is your, uh, as your uh, employer, so to speak, as he, gives you, as he gives us our job. He tells us our duties. He says to go and preach the gospel. Every one of us are commanded. If you're born again tonight, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, then when you got saved, you were given a command, and that was to go and preach the gospel. Amen. Number two, soul winners are needed. Soul winners are needed. Number one, soul winners are commanded. Uh, and I forgot to give you a verse, but uh, we don't have time, but I'll just quote it for you. The Bible talks about in, uh, when Jesus, he, gra- he, he brought the disciples together, and the Bible says he sent them out two by two. Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. Why? For soul winning. Amen. He commanded them. He said, hey, go. He didn't want the disciples spending all his all their time just around him. The disciples came, they learned from Jesus, they sat at his feet, Jesus taught them, and then he sent them out two by two. That's what we do at the church. We gather together, we meet, amen, we grow, we learn from the word of God, but ultimately we're learning why to win people to Jesus Christ. And then that's why we go, we leave, amen. People won't get saved if we just sit here. People won't know about Jesus if all we do is ever sit in church and learn at the feet of Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, quit, quit staying right here. He sent them out. He said, you've got to go. That's why we have a church-wide soul winning. Why? Because the command to the church is to go. Souls will never be saved if we never go. Number two, we have to realize soul winners are needed. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men in 2 Corinthians 5.11. The greatest cause for soul winning, the greatest cause to, for you to allow God to use you as a tool is to realize there's a need, and that need is hell. To not witness to somebody, to not give them the gospel, would be like not warning the sleeping occupants of a burning building of their danger. Christians know of an eternal hellfire that is awaiting all that are lost for eternity. And yet we still never say anything. We have friends and we have family that we know are lost. We have co-workers that we know are lost and are going to die and spend eternity in hell. And yet we keep our mouths shut. Well, I, I don't think I can. God said he needs you. God put you there for a reason. You're God's tool. God has a job he wants you to get done. God didn't select somebody else. Sometimes churches, and what we do is we think, well, well, I'll send the pastor. No, God wants you. That's why God's put you there. When I was at work, I would witness to people at work, amen. I didn't call my dad and say, hey, dad, I have somebody for you to go with. No, I witnessed to people. Why? Because I knew that I had a personal connection. God put it on my heart. When we went out to Africa, and uh, we, all got in a car, we all got in this truck, and we were driving down the road to Africa, uh, 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 or not in, well, not to Africa, excuse me. You have to fly to get to Africa, pardon me. But we were in Africa. We were in South Africa driving to Botswana, and uh, Brother uh, Rousseau, he was in the, in the, uh, the, he was the one driving the truck, and they drive on the opposite side of the road, and it's just all a mess. But he told us, he said, gentlemen, he said, if you see somebody the Lord tells you to witness to, he said, tell me to stop. And I was like, what? And he said, he said, I'm busy driving. He said, but you may see somebody. And it reminded me that, you know, God touches our hearts for certain people that he may not. God may touch your heart about somebody that he doesn't touch my heart. You know why? Because God wants you to witness to him. If you're burdened about somebody and you say, man, they need the gospel, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, I want to use you. But Sometimes we think, oh, man, I'm burdened. Hey, pastor, go tell that guy. <laughs> God says, no, his goal is that for you to tell him. Because, see, if you tell the people you're burdened for, then God lets me tell the people I'm burdened for. But if, but if the pastor runs around here, and then runs around here, and then runs here, and then runs here, and now that's not bad. I love doing it. I love giving people the gospel. But the goal should be that every one of us, when any given time somebody says, hey, I want to know how to be saved, you can say, hey, come here, let me, let me tell you. Let me take you down here. Amen. That's the goal. Soul winners are needed. Why? Letter A on there, time is short. Romans 13, 11 says, For now, the end of it says, For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Time is short. The reason that a church 
has to be busy about giving the gospel is because there's not much time left. Have you seen this world? We're a mess. Jesus is coming very soon. You listen to your pastor. Jesus is coming very soon. Could be tomorrow. But this world is a mess. And you don't have much time to give those people the gospel. You can prolong and prolong, but one day you'll procrastinate too long. There's not a lot of time. People want to know the gospel. But we think that we've got time. I'll tell them later. You may not have later. I'll tell my family next Christmas. You may not have next Christmas. Listen to me. Time is short. We've got to get in a mindset to understand that we don't have time. Time is not an ally. It's very short. Letter B, a soul winners are needed. Why? Because the blood will be on our hands. Ezekiel 3.18 says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. The Bible says that if you know somebody that you don't give the gospel to, when God casts them into eternity in hell fire, the Bible says, at your hand, God will have their blood. God will require their blood at your hand. I believe this. I believe we will know for eternity the people we did not give the gospel to just by looking at our hands. You'll be able to look at your hand and know every person you should have given the gospel to. Because God says he'll require their blood at your hand. Don't let that happen. Paul, he was busy about it. Paul said there's not one person. He's the only man I've ever seen or ever heard claim this. But Paul in the Bible said he gave the gospel to everyone. He talked about giving the gospel to everybody he came in contact with. Why? I believe Paul did not want their blood to be on his hands. As a believer... We ought to be the same. We don't want the blood on our hands. Let her see. Because the lake of fire is forever. Now I know Wednesday nights are supposed to be encouraging. But I'm encouraging you to give the gospel. Because my friend there's a lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 talks about the second death. One day people are going to spend eternity in a lake of fire. It's not a party. It's not a get-together with a bunch of hammocks where people drink sweet tea. Well, if you're from the south, you drink sweet tea. If you're from the north, you just drink iced tea. My wife gets on to me about that. But my friends, hell is a lake of fire and brimstone. It's torture. It's a punishment. It's not something that is going to be pleasant. It's an eternity, and it's eternity away from God. So winners are needed because of a lake of fire. You say, preacher, how come we talk about going soul winning and people getting saved and all of those things? Let me tell you why. Because there's a lake of fire. Can you tell me one day in eternity what will be more important? Will it be more important that we stood around together and we had fellowship, although I love it? Or will it be more important one day when we talk about, hey, they got saved. Hey, they were at church. And they got saved. Hey, I invited that guy to church. And he, he walked the aisle. And he got saved. Praise the Lord. One day I'll get to shake Brother Johnny's and Miss Cindy's hand. I'm excited about it. I'll be in heaven one day and get to shake their hand. And they'll say, Pastor, thank you for going to Wichita, Kansas. You led me to Jesus. I'm here today. Will anybody be able to walk up to you and say, Hey, thanks for giving me the gospel. We're so busy. We're so busy worried about so many things, but God says go back to the basics and remember that the very purpose that God has designed you for is to win people to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. We're needed. My friend, can I tell you you're needed in Wichita, Kansas? Do you know how many churches are in Wichita, Kansas? Do you know how many of them actually te preach the gospel? I know of three. I know of three that actually go and preach the gospel. Now, there may be more, but I know currently of three that I know could sit down and lead somebody to the Lord and go visiting and go soul winning. 
In Wichita, there's a million people. And one of those three churches is us. Does that tell you how much you're needed in Wichita, Kansas? People need us today. A million people with three Baptist churches to try to keep people out of a lake of fire that's eternal. Do you know in the city of Nineveh, it's estimated that by the time Noah got there, three days of procrastination by the time he got there, over 100,000 people died. Can you imagine what Wichita's like in three days? We only go soul winning on, we only have a church wide soul winning on Saturday. What happens in seven days? You know how many people die? We're needed. Number three, soul winners are empowered. The blessing about soul winning is you don't go alone. You're empowered. God tells you to go. God wants you to be to understand the need to go, but then God doesn't just send you alone. The Bible says God sends the Holy Spirit with you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost lives on the inside. When you go sowing, the Holy Ghost goes with you. One of the best things about going soul winning is that the believer can rely on the Holy Spirit to do the work, not him. See, this is the good thing. You're a tool. And this is why I use this illustration. But do you realize that in and of yourself, you can do nothing? Brother West is an architect. And he was painting and do all, he does all kinds of stuff. He's just, he's a, he's a neat guy. I like to just stand around and watch and learn from all his cool tricks and tools that he has. I look, I was asking him, how much was this? How much was that? And I get, you know, and then I tell my wife, I'm going to buy this. He's like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> but he has all those tools. But you realize those tools can't do anything by themselves. The tools would just sit there and rust. But when they're placed into the hand of the master... Something can be done. You see, the blessing about going soul winning is you're the tool. But God is the one that puts it to work. God is the one that will point you in the right direction. God is the one that will do the work. He just needs somebody to do it through. You see, the Holy Spirit works on the light. When we go soul winning, the Holy Spirit's already working on hearts. See, when Brother Johnny came in Miss Cindy, they wanted to get saved. It wasn't because I persuaded them and, and, I, and, I, and, and all of these things, although I gave them the gospel, and we are to try to persuade men. But ultimately, the reason they trusted Christ was because on the inside, the Holy Spirit was working and convicting about heaven. God just allowed our church to be the tool to persuade them. See, God is already working on people in Wichita, Kansas. God is already working on hearts. He's just waiting on somebody to yield and let them be the tool to get it done. Because Romans 10 talks about how shall they hear without a preacher. So God has a goal and God knows that there are people that can be saved, but they'll never hear unless God has a tool. That's why God empowers us. We have to yield to God. Also... These tools have battery packs. If they're charged, they can do it. If they're not charged, they don't get anything done. Do you know as a Christian, you can be spiritually dry, spiritually empty, to where God can't use you? God will come to use you, but you're so spiritually dry, God can't get anything done. This is what happens when Christians get backslidden. God goes to use you because you meet somebody and somebody, I've, I've seen it where backslidden Christians are asked, hey, how do I go to heaven? And they're so spiritually dry, nobody gets saved. Or they try to go soul winning. They're saying, I'm going soul winning, pastor. But they're so backslidden that God can't do anything with them. You've got to get spiritually charged up. You've got to be in your Bible. You've got to be in prayer. You've got to be in church. You've got to get your spiritual battery charged. So that way when God says, hey, I need a tool. Here we go. Okay. We're ready to go. 
But a lot of times God walks by Christians and says, hey, I need, I need some. I don't know. I can't use that one. Well, here we No, I can't use that one. And I believe this. There's a lot of work in the ministry that never gets done because God never has a tool. We're not spiritually charged. You've got to get your spiritual battery in the Word of God. Plug it into God's Word. The Bible says, abide in the vine. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. If you're not spending time in your Bible reading and you're not spending time in prayer, you're not getting that spiritual charge. So that way when God needs you, you'll be ready. Soul winners are empowered. Empowered through the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit can't use somebody that doesn't spend time getting charged up. That's why we have church. You get charged up. You get ready. You're, sped, you're, you're, you're fed the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.4 says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The Holy Spirit will teach the Christian and will help the Christian be used as a tool to win souls. Amen. The story is told of a man named John Harper. John Harper was on the Titanic. He was a Baptist preacher. Him and his daughter, his wife had just recently passed away, and him and his daughter were on the boat traveling. He was actually supposed to take a church in Chicago, was his ultimate destination. When the Titanic began to sink, John Harper, and I just read this story this last week, Baptist preacher John Harper, when the Titanic began to sink, he began to run around and began to tell everybody. He said, all the women and the lost get into the boats. He began to gather people. He, would, he put on a life jacket. And he began to help people into the boats and help people into the boats. Finally, he got to where the, he had to jump ship. He jumped the ship, and he was swimming around to everybody in his life jacket. And the story go, and it, it's a true story. You can look it up. John Harper, H-A-R-P-E-R. He was swimming around to all the people that didn't get into the boats. And he said, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He took his life jacket off and threw it to a man across the water and said, here, you need this more than I do. He'd swim around to the next person. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Some rejected, some accepted. Four years later, they had a meeting. All the people that survived the Titanic were there, and they all gave testimonies. One man raised his hand. He said, I'd like to give a testimony. He said, I was in the water before a rescue boat finally came and sunk, or uh, and, and, uh, before the, uh, after the Titanic sunk and a rescue boat came and got me. He said, I was holding on to a board, and a man came and swam to me and said, Sir, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He said, I told the man, no, I didn't want to. Said the man swam away, went to a few others, came back to me and said, Sir, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He said, I accepted and I believed on Christ as my Savior. He said, the moment that I prayed and accepted Jesus as my Savior, he said, I watched him slip off into the waters. He said, I'm the last convert of John Harper. You see, my dear friend, God is going to take you places you never thought you'd go. God is going to put you in situations you never thought you'd have to be in. But it's because God needs a tool somewhere. Not, I don't think there's anybody in the room that would have wanted to be on the Titanic. But thank the Lord there was somebody to give the gospel to those people before they die. But it's because somebody was willing to be a tool. How many of us would have been worried so much about ourselves... And I agree, me, and, and I'm in the same boat. I, I don't know if I would have had the integrity that man had to give his life like that. I would have been wanting to get in the boat with my daughter, save my family. I can't say, to be honest, that I would have reacted the same way, and it convicted me when I read the story. How many Christians would have been going about trying to be a witness? You see, you have to come to the mindset that there's more to life Amen. There's more to life than what's going on now. There's an eternity. The last thing, soul winners are rewarded. 
Soul winners are rewarded. Letter A, and I didn't put these under there, but you can write them down. Letter A, there's joy. The Bible says in Psalms 126, 5 through 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. You know the blessing is? When you've been praying for somebody, and you know they're lost, and you've been begging God that they get saved, and then you get to go to them with your Bible and say, Dear friend, can I tell you about Jesus? And you get a chance to lead them to Christ. You know how much joy there is in that. But that's a joy that not every Christian will know. Because not every Christian's a soul winner. If you're never, if you never win anybody to Jesus, then my friend, you'll never have this specific joy that comes from soul winning. Letter B, there's a crown of rejoicing. The Bible says, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. There's a specific crown in heaven for Christians that are soul winners. You see, Jesus will be able to walk around heaven one day and see all the believers, and he'll know which ones were soul winners. What a convicting thought. He'll be able to know by our crowns if we led anybody to him. Did we just get saved and say, praise the Lord, I'm saved, and then keep it to ourselves? Let her see other rewards. There are other rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive of his own reward according to his own labor. I may have misquoted that. I apologize. But 1 Corinthians 3, 8 talks about that every man one day in heaven will receive uh, a reward for his labor. See, there are some men that win more souls to, to, than others. There are some men that win, and some ladies that win hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Dr. Jack Hiles in his ministry as a pastor there in Chicago, when he preached, it's, it's estimated millions of people came to Christ. We may never see that many, but God doesn't ask us to see as many as the next person. God doesn't compare us and say, well, you need to win souls like that man, or you need to win souls like that lady. God just wants you to win who you can, and God gives you a reward for that. God's not one day going to look and say, well, this person did more than this. God rewards you according to your labor. Where God want, were you able to be used? God doesn't want to look, at, God's not looking for quality, I mean for quantity, as much as he's looking for the quality. Were you, be, were you able to be used when God needed you? Adoniram Judson is a mission, was a missionary. Excuse me. He passed away. But when he was a missionary, he in his first five years of being a missionary, he never saw one person saved. Not one person. Gave the gospel over and over and over. Never saw anybody saved. It wasn't until after his wife finally died that one man got saved. From that one man, there finally came a church. But it took Adoniram Judson years in Burma before anybody got saved. See, for most Baptists, we would have thrown him off our, hey, you're out. That's because we don't realize that not everybody's going to win as many as others, but everybody can win somebody. Now, conclusion will be done. Simple steps for soul winning. Here's, a, here's just some simple, simple steps. To being a soul winning, to being a soul winner. Number one, have a definite time to go. Have a definite time to go. You set a time when you go. You can't say, well, I'll just go here and there or whenever I have a chance. It's best if you set a time, just like we set a time to work, we set a time to sleep, we set a time to eat, we set a time, have a time. That's why uh, we put on there on Saturdays or and uh, or maybe my uh, I know other churches do them on Thursdays. Some Churches do them on Tuesday nights, whenever you can, but set a time. And that's why as a church, we set a time that we can go as a church. Why? Because if we never if we never but schedule it or put it in the budget of time, we'll never do it. So we schedule it to get done. Why? Because it's worthy. It's so important. Just like we have scheduled for times to have fellowship, and we schedule for times to do this, and we schedule for times to do that, but the most important thing we schedule is that every week, Winning souls to Jesus. Now, that means not everybody can make it, 
but we schedule it. So if you can, you can go. Maybe you can't go that time. Set another time during the week. Have a definite time you plan on going. Uh, my my, my mother-in-law, when she was pregnant uh, with Ethan, uh, she would go with another lady in the church besides their soul winning time. They'd go soul winning every week. They wanted to see people saved so bad. They would go another time during the week because they were both stay-at-home moms, and they said, hey, we want to win souls. They went multiple times a week sometimes. Just whenever they got a chance, they would just go together, and they've got some funny stories. But they would go, and they would set a time, and they would meet, and then they would go. Have a definite time you go. There's never an excuse not to go. It's that important. Number two, be a clean vessel. Another thing about these tools is if I don't keep them clean, they're not very useful. See, if I just take the tool and throw it around in the mud or when I'm using it, I never wash it or never clean it off or just let it just get rusty, eventually it, it becomes useless because I don't take time to clean it. If you as a Christian don't take time in prayer, as we talked about, we don't take time in prayer to clean ourselves, to get ourselves cleaned up, to get ourselves refreshed in the Word of God and confess those sins to God, get them out, and, talk, and, 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 and if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, and, and get, them to God, get them out to God, if we continue to hold that sin against God, we don't remain clean. God can't use a dirty vessel. God won't use a vessel that's tainted by the world. That's why we talk about how we look, because sometimes the, how we look can be a hindrance to others being saved. I had a pastor friend of mine. In fact, it was Dr. Bob Gray Jr. there in Longview. I'll tell you this last story. We'll hurry me down. It was so funny, though. I had another pastor or somebody. It was another pastor or it was somebody that went to another church in town. And uh, he was the youth worker kind of thing. He was with the youth. But he was this hip dude. He was, hey, you know. He had the cool clothes, you know, and kind of baggy spiked up hair like all the way around you know it was just like it was that hip look you know uh just go you know. and uh, so they got talking about soul winning pastor gray you know he's shirt and tie you know got talking about soul winning and the guy says hey watch this pastor he says i can win souls just like you he said he walks over to the guy across the table gives him a track and tries to give him the gospel he had to borrow pastor gray's track because he didn't have any because his church don't have tracks so he said let me borrow a track <laughs> And uh, he tried to give the guy gospel. The guy looked at him and said, no, no, thank you. And so Pastor Gray just sat there, and he came back and said, did he get saved? And the man said, no, oh, no, I don't know. Uh, he, he just didn't want it. Pastor Gray said, okay. He said, let me try. He walked over there, sat down. He said, sir, can I show you how you can know if you died to go to heaven, sir? And the guy looked at him and said, yeah. <laughs> the man bowed his head and trusted Christ. <laughs> cool guy. How'd you do that? Pastor Gray said, he said, my friend, you need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. But when, the, when you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, he said, you'll, fri- you'll find that the Holy Spirit changes you on the inside and on the outside. See, he was more about, let's just change the inside. We can look like the world, talk like the world, but still win people to Jesus. Pastor Gray said, if they see the same thing in you that's in them, they're not going to want what you have. That's why we have to be a clean vessel. Number three, ask for the Holy Spirit's power. You can never be a witness if you're not yielded to the Holy Spirit. God says, ask and ye shall receive. And God specifically says we can ask for the Holy Spirit's power and God will give it to us. The Father will give you the Holy Spirit's power or authority to give the gospel. You say, Pastor, I'm scared, or, or maybe I, I, I'm, I'm a little shy. I am very shy when it comes to giving people the gospel. I've had to pray many times and ask the Holy Spirit for help because I, I'm not an outgoing person sometimes. I, 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 I'm surprised that the Lord asked me to preach because I, I was when I, my first sermon I literally was, open your Bible. I mean, for about, I mean, it was that way for 20 minutes. Finally, my dad just sat me down. And he said, good job, son. I was scared to death. Scared to death. <laughs> you will be scared. So you've got to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Amen. The Holy Spirit will give you the boldness that you need. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Acts 4, 31, talk about that. 
Number four, have the compassion of Christ for the lost. If you never look at the lost through the eyes of Jesus, you'll never have Christ's compassion. Look at him how Jesus sees them, lost. We see people as just everyday acquaintances. Jesus sees the soul. Have the compassion of Christ. Number five, deal with sinners as if you are a fellow sinner, not a superior being. A lot of times Christians, when we talk to people about being saved, we say, now, if you'd like to be saved, you know, and, and sometimes we're, 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 we're look like, we act like we're superior if we're not careful. I've done it. I was a teenager. I thought I knew everything. You know how teenagers are. <clears throat> right. I mean, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But soul winning. Oh, Viviana. You, yeah, that's right. You're 13 now. Oh. Well, you're too tall. To, you're, too, you're tall enough to be a teenager. That's what it is. I get confused with that girl. But soul winning can be defined like this. Soul winning is one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. <laughs> I love that illustration. Soul winning is only one beggar telling another beggar, hey, this is where you find bread. You're a sinner like everybody else. When you talk to people, you just tell them, say, hey, I got, I, I, I got, I got saved. <laughs> if you don't know what else, tell them, say, hey, I got saved. They look at you, what? What happened? <laughs> so I, I, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I get to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven too? You'd be surprised. People say, yeah. One time I walked up to somebody and I said, hey. I said, you know you're going to hell. <laughs> he looked at me. He's like, what? I said, yeah. I said, I was too. <laughs> that guy looked at me. What? I said, but somebody told me how I can go to heaven. I said, would you like to know? Yeah. You know? And we just had a normal conversation. Sometimes we, we struggle. What, what, what do I say? How, how do I be pastoral? Ah, don't worry about that. You don't got to preach a sermon to them. Just tell them how you got saved. Just be, hey, hey, man, would you like to know how to go to heaven? I, when I talk to teenagers, I say, hey. They look at me. I, 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 one time there was these guys, a group of guys running down the, they're walking down the road. I go running. We're in Tyler, in, in, in ghetto Tyler, and I go running. Hey! All these guys, this white guy in a shirt and tie is coming at him. <laughs> hey! <laughs> they looked at me. They're like, what? I said, dude, I said, I have got the most important thing to tell you. They're like, really, really, what? <laughs> I said, I can tell you how you can go to heaven. What? I said, yeah, would you like to know? Yeah. You'd be surprised. Just be normal. Sometimes we, over, we overdo it. Well, I, I got a plan. Just, just tell somebody how to go to heaven, amen. Give somebody the gospel. People want to be saved. But we have to remember, and we're, and we're closing now. I'm closing my Bible. <laughs> Down here. I'm closing my notes. Just remember the object of the church, the goal, everything we do, the reason God instituted the church, the reason we gather, the reason we have these the hymn books, the reason we do every ministry is because we want to be a tool to win souls. That's the goal. Everything we do. Every ministry the church can have is to win souls. That's got to be our heartbeat. If that's not our heartbeat, then what we're doing is we're letting our tools get dirty. When, when churches try to, win, when try to attract people through other means and do all this stuff, and they're not focused on winning souls, then God stops using that tool. As a church, God will stop using us if our focus is not winning souls. Amen. Let's win people to Christ. Let's be soul winners. Amen. Throughout the week, there's tracks back there. Grab you a handful of tracks, and just when you have a chance, you meet somebody. You're going through the drive-thru. Give somebody a track. I was at the taco shop, and I told you I was going to be done. Boy, I'm a liar. Lord, forgive me. I was at the taco shop, my wife and I, and the lady handed us the food, and I handed her a track. I said, hey, I'm the new pastor just right across over here at Maze Grace Baptist Church. She goes, you know, every pastor comes by and gives me a track from that church. She's like, and they all like the taco shop. <laughs> I started laughing. I said, well, have you gone? She's like, well, I went one time. I said, well, you need to come back. Amen. And I didn't get a chance to give her the gospel course through the drive through but I gave her that track because the gospel's in those tracks. Get those out. Amen. Be concerned. Give people the gospel. Amen. If we're not busy trying to reach people, then God will stop being busy blessing our church. Amen. That's what will bless the church. That's what will bring God's hand on us. You want to see revival in America? Tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you.
Lord, forgive me for taking more time of your, uh, Lord, your people, Lord. Thank you for the precious time that they've given to you, Lord, here at your house. Lord, I pray that you'd bless now, Lord, as we go home and, Lord, we meditate on the message that was given. May we be reminded, Holy Spirit of God, how important that it is to win people to Christ. Lord, may you give us soul winners' hearts. May you give us a burden to reach the lost. God, would you give us tears? Lord, one thing I pray for is tears. You said, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Lord, would we weep for people that are lost? Would we weep, Lord, to give the gospel to those that we know are not saved? Would you help us, Lord, as a church to make that our focus? Would from now on, Lord, in the future, everything that we do, may nothing be more important than soul winning. May nothing, Lord, take preeminence in our lives and our schedules than giving, than giving people the gospel. Would you please help us, Lord, to be focused on that? People are dying and going to hell. May we give the gospel. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Wouldn't be right of a pastor not to ask, do you know today that if you die that you'd go to heaven? The goal of our church is that we make sure that people know and we give the gospel. But we've got to start with us. Is that something that you know, dear, Christ, dear friend? Maybe you're not saved today. Maybe you say, well, pastor, you know, I can't go soul winning and tell others about what I don't have. Would that be you today? You'd say, pastor, I, I don't know that if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I'd sure like to know. You'd simply raise your hand. Give me an opportunity real quick to show you. I won't call your name out. won't embarrass you, but would that be you tonight? you say, pastor, I don't know if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I'd sure like to know. You'd real quick raise your hand, put it up, and put it back down. Anybody like that? All right. By testimony, everybody here is born again. Now, Christian, everyone here, of course, besides the children we know, that are the children that haven't understood, but everybody that's born again, that's trusted Christ as our Savior, it's our job to preach the gospel. Let's be busy about it. Let's not take for granted the time that God's given to us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the message that you put on my heart. Thank you, Lord. Pray that you bless now as we go home. And, Lord, may we be focused on being soul winners. We love you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you so much.